Welcome to our podcast for Pacific Center of Lifelong Learning. Our guest today is Dr. Stephen Cowan, a holistic developmental pediatrician and Chinese medicine practitioner. He's been treating children with autism and other chronic medical conditions for over 30 years. Dr. Cowan has a subspecialty in developmental pediatrics and has developed a unique holistic approach to evaluating and treating children struggling with chronic physical, emotional, and cognitive disorders. Considering the child as a reflection of the interrelated forces of family and environment is the central focus of his practice. This approach respects the inseparability of mind, body, and spirit, and promotes a deeper understanding of what it means to be healthy. In addition to his practices in Westchester and Manhattan, Dr. Cowan lectures across the United States and internationally. Dr. Cowan is also the author of several books, including Fire Child, Water Child, uh, How Understanding the Five Types of ADHD Can Help You to Improve Your Child's Self-Esteem and Attention, and also The Lost Elephant and Vessel of Promises. He also runs Tornasol Kids, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that empowers children through online education, workshops, and community outreach whose programs teach holistic, healthy child development strategies to kids, parents, educators, and caregivers that identify and meet the individual physical and emotional needs of children. Well, Dr. Cowan, Stephen, it's wonderful. Please, Stephen, please. Yeah, it's just so it's such an honor and, and a pleasure to have you with us today. I'm really excited to have a conversation with you about your experience and, and what you do. And first of all, where do you get all the time and the day to treat patients and, and run a nonprofit and and put pen to paper and author children's books. It's, it's uh, yeah, amazing. Yeah, children's books and, uh, you know, COVID this year, yeah. Greg, you know, somehow 30 songs came through too that I was recording. So there's just a lot of, and I paint and, you know, I think, you know, the, we can call it Yuan Chi, you know, it's this source Chi that when you access that there's unlimited time in the day, Mm -hmm. right? If every minute matters, then you find there's a a productivity built into that. And Mm. if you love it, it's not work, right? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And we were just talking before, about your Chinese name. And I, I'd like you to actually share that with our audience that uh, your wife had it engraved on your guitar. Yeah, you know, the name was given to be by uh, my Tai Chi teacher that I've studied with for over 30 years, uh, Ed Young. Um, it's a play on my name, Cowan becomes Gowan. And Gowan, uh, in this, the characters chosen are high gal tower or elevated you know i love the old seal form characters i've studied them for many many years and use them in my teaching Mm -hmm. um and Juan is this um basically a toy or or a child's toy or a plaything so high or elevated toy kind of picture it captures my spirit in what i do with kids you know if you don't most of what i've developed in using the lens of Chinese medicine are games to play with children, mm-hmm. whether it's with acupuncture or Qigong or family interactions, it's all built around play, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. the original way all of us learned anything. I was gonna ask you about that a little bit later, but since you brought it up, um, you know, in my, practice and in my teaching in at school and my supervising in the, the Pacific College Clinic, um, I haven't treated a lot of pediatrics. Um, I have four children. I love children. Then but you it, have. <laughs> well, that's true. But where I'm going with this is that, you know, coming through a, a traditional education uh, through our college, you know, I've gotten to a place where I, I've seen not that many children come through the clinic and and so therefore 
the students don't get a lot of training in treating children. So when they do come, they're uncomfortable with it because they don't right. understand that playfulness and, you know, maybe drawing pictures on Hagu or, you know, yeah, doing exactly. that. So, well, one, I'll give you an example of a fun game I play that's actually a high game, you know, a Gawan, which uh -huh. is um, the names of the points are very important to me, mm -hmm. both the characters and the story each point tells. Mm -hmm. Hegu is a great example. So often the game I play with kids, there are several games I'll play just built around acupuncture with kids. Since I limit my practice to kids, in reality, that means to their parents. Right. Um, because there is a link between them uh, and not just a link, but a formative relationship that is being treated. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, for example, I'll treat the parent and the child together holding hands oh, so wow. that they make almost like an ion pump between them and i have them pump the, between the points oh. but the interesting game that i like to do is uh, i'll choose a point and i'll explain the name of the point to the child mm -hmm. you know and the meaning of it and then i'll have them choose a point and then I'll choose another point, and then I'll have them choose a point, and I'll say, well, let's look at the story that we just told through, what's the adventure, the children's story that's being told from LI4, which doesn't have any spirit of childhood in it, right. but, you know, this, you know, Hegu, you know, has all kinds of metaphoric meanings to it, right? Or, mm -hmm. or you know, three mile foot, Right. right, you know, yeah. um, there are all kinds, you know, all kinds of great stories. And then the child and I will create an adventure story mm. based on the order of the points that we chose mm. or the order I needle them. And then we do a visualization of that story, almost like a children's story. Fantastic. And that the points really tell the story. And that's a very Taoist way of thinking about choosing points based mm. on on the meanings, you know, um, and so that's one game, you know, and then we bring in a mom or a dad or a parent of any kind that sits and I say, let's add them into the story. What point do you think mom needs? Mm -hmm. And then I'll needle that point and then they hold hands and bring the story together and you're rounding out a story into a much bigger story, a bigger adventure, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's another great game. These are all kind of secrets of the treatment room games because I've been doing this for so many years. Mm -hmm. um, there's a game of taking the needles out mm -hmm. that becomes a mindfulness game. Mm -hmm. I'll cover my hand over the needle. Mm -hmm. I use a lot of tuning forks on the needles to oh. activate them. It's a whole uh -huh. technique that I kind of developed with one of my early teachers and, uh, you know, I, I, my, my training was all the old school apprenticeship stuff, mm -hmm. I think, because I was a, already a doctor, you know, anyway. Mm -hmm. So one of the games is a kind of hide and seek game where I'll cover my hand. I'll say, you get a point if you're right. I get a point if you're wrong. Tell me if it's in or out. And then I'll do that without them seeing to, and sometimes I take it out and sometimes I don't, but I want them staying active. I want their shen, their, their mind, their consciousness activating the point. Mm -hmm. That's way more important than the needle. Yeah. Right. If yeah. you're walking around aware of, you know, do 20 all day, mm -hmm. well, that's actually a Tai Chi practice called right. wearing the moon. Mm -hmm. It's called wearing the moon and you're walking around conscious that you have the heavens balanced on the top of your head. Mm -hmm. So all of these become, so there's a game and kids will come in and say, um, all right, we can do acupuncture, but can we do the game? Yeah. And what they mean is the in and out game at the end uh -huh. so that they're really aware of the presence of a needle in their body. Mm -hmm. or not in their body. And sometimes some kids are so disembodied, and this leads into the topic today. Mm -hmm. Sometimes kids are so disembodied yeah. because everything is so directed at mind in our culture. 
mm-hmm. that they have no idea whether they're in or in. Yeah. yeah. And I say, when you get really good working with me, you'll shut me out. You'll get all the points and I won't be able to trick you. Ah, it becomes okay. like a, a, a challenge. So these are the kind of spirit of the Gawan, the spirit of the, the way to play. You know, in Tai Chi, we don't say we do Tai Chi. Mm-hmm. We say we play Tai Chi, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like we play a violin, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So imagine saying, I'm gonna play acupuncture with you. Yeah. How does it change that when you say that? Well, it definitely dispels a lot of needle phobia, I would suggest. I don't is... even call them needles. What do I you call them? them? I call them hairs or oh. pins. Okay. Usually I just call them hairs. And first I have a kid, the very first thing I ever do when I'm first meeting a kid to needle is I'll have them needle me mm-hmm. on hegu. Okay. And which is a pretty powerful point. Sure. And I can learn a lot about the kid by his needle technique on me. Uh huh. Yeah. Hardly yeah. in, very, very reserved, deep. Yeah, in, yeah. But yeah. It, their energy is coming into me in a way that is actually giving me valuable information about where they're at. Yeah. And sometimes I get some pretty good treatments just with that. And then I pull it out and then I bend it so that they can see it's just a hair. Uh-huh. not a needle because remember yeah. in our culture they've been already conditioned by the word needle to be a shot yeah. you know vaccination yeah i always thought that it, that needle was an unfortunate term that we use yeah. but i couldn't i love the i love the fact that you've adopted hair pin is still has a sharp Pill connotation has, in my yeah. mind the hair hairs works kids hairs are wonderful. not afraid of hairs and you know, the other thing, I don't call them acupuncture points because the true name are holes. Mm-hmm. That's the true m- meaning of the word in Chinese and mm-hmm. when you, or spaces. And when you start feeling for the spaces, right? Mm-hmm. I let them find the point. Mm-hmm. They get it, that it's not going in their bone or the you know, muscle, or they're finding these, spaces in between mm-hmm. now greg you know this spaces in between is the core of what i'm going to teach at pacific in october mm-hmm. okay treating the space between interesting we're going to get into that for sure i want to i want to frame this conversation a little bit now on on the subject and I, I your wisdom and how you approach children is phenomenal and we'll get back into sure. obviously more of that but i you mentioned in some material that i read in advance off your website actually um that it's estimated that one in 48 children are now being diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder asd yeah. this is a shocking number that's risen from one in 3,000 children over the past 25 years. And you also suggest that chronic inflammation and the toxic stress that it places on our biology is at least in part to blame. I have some ideas of how we got here, food and water and air, but what does the research suggest on how we arrived here? And what is your experience in, um, yeah. in this well, growing research- statistic? Yeah, it's, it, let me start with a story because I like telling stories and I think it'll give you a personalized view of how, how we got here perhaps or where we are. Mm-hmm. So in 1987, probably before many of the listeners were born, I was you know, doing my developmental training as part of Columbia Developmental Disability Center. And we saw one kid in three years mm. with autism. Wow. Now, it was such a curiosity back then mm-hmm. that I would bring my students in to meet this boy because it was so rare. Nobody had ever seen anything like that. 
A few years later, you know, I, I was out in practice already um, as a specialist in child development. And uh, I start getting, you know, a kid every few months that I'm diagnosing, which I thought was weird because it wasn't the area that I was drawn to. Um, how could it be? It was the rarest of rare things, right? So my interest back then and still is, and that's how these things converge, is how chronic illness, physical illness or trauma affects development. Mm -hmm. That was my, what I was known for. Mm -hmm. So there was this meeting in New York City of a kind of convergence of all the great minds, neurologists and psychiatrists and psychologists in the field. And I just innocently, I was young, I innocently said, hey, anybody else seeing like more autism? And people freaked out. They said, no, 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 Steve, you're just making a name for yourself out there and drawing more, you know, I said, but not really specialized in that why would they be coming so they didn't want to hear it right and mm -hmm. i being young and innocent said okay pat myself on the back i must be making a name for myself <laughs> two years go by and now i'm starting to see a kid every month new kid diagnosed and two years go by and i go back and say hey guys something's going on here i'm now seeing you know kids my practice is filling up with these kids mm -hmm. Something's going on. And they did one of those things, you know, the, the three monkeys see, you know, see yeah. no evil, hear no evil, speak. Yeah. They did one of those on me, got mm -hmm. very agitated. Now, these were not at all integrative or holistic people. These were very conventional doctors. And they kind of freaked out. Mm -hmm. And I was insistent. At that point, I was kind of charged up that something's happening. Mm -hmm. But you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones, right? It's one of those moments where we're in completely different realities. Mm. Now, I want to ask you, Greg, why do you think they freaked out? That's a very good question. Um, I mean, totally intimidated, like fear-based yeah. reactivity. Steve, stop. If you stop, if you continue, you'll have to leave the meeting. Mm. I don't know. I mean, they're just well, think about it, you know, so maybe in, in a, trained. Yeah, unable to be effective in, in treating them or just, well, you know, yes, uncomfortable. There is with... that helplessness, but yeah. the way we were trained, autism is strictly genetic. Mm. You can't have a genetic epidemic, right? That's right. a numbers game. It's a purely right. statistical numbers game that if the population is exploding, the numbers will go up. Right. But the population isn't exploding. Yeah. So yeah. if it's not strictly genetic, well, then it's environmental, etc. Ah, cetera. but that opens up such a can of worms in these doctors' world. Mm -hmm. They're not geared to think about the vast variabilities of the environment. Right. We're separate from our from our ecosystem. Yeah. And that's the way doctors are trained. Doctors across every doctor you've ever met is trained in a very confined place called a mm -hmm. hospital, mm -hmm. which is bizarrely non-environmental. In fact, right. they kill anything that might be considered environmental in right. the air, on the skin, on everything, mm -hmm. and emergency driven. Mm -hmm. You don't go to, you know, you don't go to a, a hospital for. Mm, your worries mm -hmm. or if your diet is off you don't you go for life-threatening things and i was trained to be one of those heroes i saved many lives in that heroic er state mm -hmm. but when you're faced with something that's chronic or recurrent if it they only know how to treat it as an emergency Mm -hmm. And the dictum back in the 80s, and still is for most practitioners, is that genetics is sort of the God running the machine. Mm -hmm. This is the absurdity of 23andMe. Mm -hmm. It's absurd mm -hmm. that you're going to figure out, looking at that, what to do with your life, because mm -hmm. it's missing 90% of what's going on, yeah. which is the epigenetics. Right. 
which is the environment, as you said. And when we talk about environment, let's talk about what we mean. Because you even said, Greg, with a smile on your face, I imagine some of the things that got us here. And already that imagination is light years beyond that, those bunch of doctors at that meeting. Your training, your expertise, your, your dedication to a field of what is essentially the most holistic of medicines, Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. that doesn't, you know, in its principle, recognizes that we are 100% nature. Mm -hmm. You know, the Taoist traditions that it's originated in, you know, are, we are nature, we, the, we are microcosms, just that concept. Yeah. So autism actually was this crisis in me that got me blew me out of the world of conventional medicine. I had be become at that time uh, the medical director of a rehab hospital for children. And I was seeing kids with chronic disorders of all different kinds. And I had practiced Qigong and meditation for many years before that, all through my medical training and before. Um, and I was living with these kids up in a beautiful facility in the woods and took them on hikes and things. And I would take these kids on, you know, I would do breathing every morning because I could, I was the director. I could develop the program any way I wanted. And I was seeing kids making dramatic changes, asthmatics who had been on steroids for 10 years off all their meds. Mm, so already the mindset is that the environment matters. Yeah. And they couldn't deal with it at that moment. Mm -hmm. And that allowed me to then seek out one of my old mentors, Sid Baker, who is a really beloved man in the world of child development, who I think is now retired, but who was seeing the same thing I was seeing in autism. Mm -hmm. And he said, Steve, we have to do something. <laughs> Let's start tracking what are the variables, because there were some deaths as the numbers started rising. Mm -hmm. Parents were really desperate. There was no internet yet. Well, I guess the internet was just beginning, but people were coming in with bags of supplements and not knowing what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And so Sid began an organization that I was at one of the first meetings for to really look at um, what's going on. What are the environmental variables? Now, the global overlay that you and I can get into, because I think it really is important and it pertains so much to how Chinese medicine can offer a great deal in this world of autism. In fact, now coming out of China, since it was since the 80s, the industrialization of China to the point of 2021, they see a perfect rise in autism cases. Mm. They didn't really know. I mean, there was something called Dian uh, Kuang uh, as a syndrome, which, you know, is a kind of insanity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a kind of disengaged insanity. Mm -hmm. uh, some people try to correlate it. Machio Cho tried to correlate it with uh, uh, bipolar, manic depressive, mm -hmm. you know, the, Dian is the depressive part and the Kuang is the manic part. Mm -hmm. But if we just use the term to understand autism, Chinese medicine has been dealing with the un disembodied beings for thousands since Sun Simiao, right? Mm -hmm. Since, you know, the ghost points. Right. So there is a long tradition that Chinese medicine can offer for this field. And anybody who's open to treating children by opening the doors are gonna get somebody on the spectrum. By definition now, because one in 48, one in 50 kids, it's one in, I think it's one in 40 boys. It's 2% of the population. That's a huge number. And it's more prevalent in male? 
it's four, four to one ratio, probably five to one ratio, male to female. I think that's a faulty statistic. I think girls are getting undiagnosed and there are actually biologic reasons for that, that matter here. Um, uh, females, there is a thought, there's a, a researcher up in Boston, Jill James, that's done some research on the protective aspects of estrogen mm. to environmental toxins. Interesting. And so that there may be subtler effects still present, but not as severe because of this protective effect. If you think about the carrier on of the race or the feminine drive, the yin in us, mm -hmm. and that provides some guarantees or protection mm -hmm. against harmful agents in the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. Makes me think about cycle uh, growth cycles in in men and or boys and girls, if you will, and and then seven and eight, yeah, seven and eight year cycles, and then relationship to their external environment, food, air, and water, emotional, I'm sure, uh, along with the genetics and how that may be a protector for for them. Or not? Yeah, I think it is. You know, to a certain extent, I think the the vulnerabilities uh, to the male uh, that extra X chromosome may provide some support. You know, men are down one; they have a Y, but we don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so there is this weird um, thing that I, you know, there there are a few things that I've been tracking over the years. Um, there's a whole list that I often will show in workshops on this. Uh, and those students who know me, both from PCOM and from Pacific Symposiums and my work with Moshe Heller, you know, we run uh, pediatric courses, uh, training, year-long training courses, um, that there's a kind of too much too fast on one side. Mm -hmm. and too little too late on the end. Mm -hmm. So we get this kind of over yang and under yin imbalance inherently in our culture. Mm -hmm. Too much too fast could be, well, you know, there's a lot of things that can be in our culture. One I'll say is just even the way we're born. Yes. You know, um, we're impatient. The OBs are impatient, so we use pitocin. Mm -hmm. Pitocin is a synthetic oxytocin. Mm -hmm. Oxytocin is the love hormone that we may be blocking mm -hmm. by using a synthetic. Oxytocin is the bonding hormone. Now think about what autism is. Mm -hmm. Autism is about not connecting. Mm -hmm. Autoism, you're on autopilot. I'm on my own, mm -hmm. me against the world. You no, know, that's not the way we evolved. So, Ephraim Korngold, my dear friend and Dow brother, and uh, was my you know teacher, and now we are deep buddies and teach a lot. And uh, he and I formulated this. We once had a conversation on a beach in Cuba. We were teaching in Cuba with Paul Unschuld. Mm. We were sitting on a beach and Paul was holding court. And we talked about, you know, uh, Unschuld said, the spirit of Chinese medicine is to adapt to the times you live in. Mm -hmm. That Li Dong Wan, his medicine, his earth school medicine, spleen school, I was adapting to a specific moment in time. And so was Sun Tzu Miao's, And so was, you know, all of these great beings. It wasn't one medicine forever, Zhang Zhong Jing's medicine forever, that it has to be adaptable. And he was holding court about that. That's very much his thing. Uh -huh. And Ephraim and I looked at each other and said, well, what is the crisis of our time? Mm. And what we came up with was that it's breakdown in communication, that all the current epidemics, the chronic disorders that many acupuncturists are faced with treating are all breakdowns in communication. Mm 
maybe mm -hmm. between your organs, between each other, mm -hmm. between mind and body, between self and nature, between the, so, between me and my job. Between, you know, there are all these breakdowns. And so the way I think of it now is autism is one of a, an array of inflammatory disorders mm -hmm. that are the epidemic of alienation. Mm. That's pretty powerful. We were talking before uh, we actually started the podcast earlier today about about this past year in pandemic life, and I want you to to riff off that if you would yeah, yeah. about kids and family dynamics, and you know, being in close proximity with one another in the same house in quarantine, and this autoism. Um, how how is that affecting kids and families and what are we seeing where are we now in this time yeah you know it, it's brought almost magnified the problem it's amplified it's given us a lens into something i think uh we weren't aware was going on that we've all drifted apart we call ourselves a family mm -hmm. but we've actually not used to living together on a day-to-day -day basis in the quarantines yeah. and, the, and the, the pandemic pandemonium that's been, that we've all lived through. My practice closed down for a while, but it expanded because I started doing these Zooms like mm -hmm. we're, where we can connect, albeit through the matrix of this digital media. Yeah. It's not the same as being in a room together. And you we can't put the needle in and pull the needle out. No, no, I can teach people to, but it's still the energy of being together. Um, yes. You know, um, Todd, who introduced us today, was saying, well, when the banter is over, you guys will get press record. And I want to recognize that the banter matters. Yes. That the, that the breakdown, that the core cure for alienation syndrome, which we will call all of these things, mm. autism, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, uh, you know, ADHD, um, all the inflammatory disorders, diabetes, all these things that we see as inflammatory disorders that are out of whack, and, you know, that we're all dealing with in our practices, all the way up to cancer, which is madness, right? It's, it's, I don't need you guys. I'm going to make my own. I'm just going to keep growing. I don't need any regulations on me, right? That's a kind of cellular autism. Mm -hmm. And um, so the core um, skill or the core quality or the, the savoring is the small talk of conversation. Conversation is the coordinator of relationship. And so when I said to you earlier, the thing I'm interested in teaching is how to treat really the elephant in the room, which is the space between us. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're gonna be focusing on at the symposium in the upcoming uh, be focusing, symposium? Yes, and, and one of the points is someone who might see the calendar and say, oh, Steve Cowan is talking about autism. Often yeah. that says, well, I don't treat kids. You know, what I want people to see is this isn't about kids. Mm -hmm. This is about families. Mm -hmm. This is about our relationship to each other. You know, the Confucian model. This is where the, the confusion of Confucius is that it's been handed down in this way to think it's all this righteousness and rules and, you know, rectification of words and all that. But actually, Lao Tzu and Confucius were saying the same thing. It's just been mistranslated. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a single word that was mistranslated that Chen Man Ching, the lineage holder of my Tai Chi practice, actually was very strict about. There's a medical book I'm translating now of his that's never been out. That, of Ching Man Ching? Yeah. Okay. And, you know, Ed Young and I will eventually put it out. You know, it's been a long process, um, but the the word is about is really about uh, you know the the sage uh, is about empowering relationships that we're all related. Mm -hmm. 
and not to the word was translated wrong into modernize or rectify humans, people, rectify the people, correct the people. Mm-hmm. And the word correct, it was really meant to be relate to people. Yeah. Which changes it completely into a much more loving way. And, and what uh, Chen Man Ching said was the only person who saw it, he was astounded by this, was a non-Chinese person who picked up on it. Mm. Arthur Whaley. Mm. Arthur Whaley, one of the first translators of the Tao Te Ching, right? Um, who, who met Chen Man Ching and they had this dialogue and opened his eyes to this, oh my God, yes. And he went back and looked at the words and he, he absolutely, and he was like vehement about this. So this relationship, this relatedness, mm-hmm. which is at the core of autism, I want people to see that inflammation, mm-hmm. in, chronic inflammatory disorders of any kind that you're gonna deal with in your practice, forget autism, they're all a, come from one thing, mm-hmm. a breakdown in relationships, a breakdown or an alienation within the space between. Mm-hmm. So in the banter you and I were talking about, I was explaining how, you know, how the parent and the child hold hands while they're both being needled. Yes. And then they create their own organic ion pump by literally pumping between, mm-hmm. you know. Um, we're actually treating the space between. Mm-hmm. And the inflammation process is dictated by one organ. Do you know what organ that is? The inflammation process? Yeah. Or let's call it the relationship breakdown. Well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking hard as the emperor. Yes, hard as the emperor, who's supposed to sit meditating and be empty in a chamber, and pericardium guards him on the mm-hmm. outside of it, right? Mm-hmm. And what guards the pericardium? The triple burner. Triple burner. The San yeah. Jiao, right? Uh-huh. The, the, you know, the yang of the pericardium, right? The, so the triple burner, the Sanja, is the mediator of relationships. Mm. That makes sense with the, the and that, that makes perfect sense with the space between yes. model because of the interstitial fluid and the exactly. pumping and the cleansing and the thermodynamics. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And water, which is, you know, the closest thing Lao Tzu says to the Tao, in the ability to flow and to to dissolve things and to message things. And, you know, this quality um, goes where humans don't want to go. You know, the interstices, you know, has recently been discovered as an organ called the interstitium. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know the organ was there all these great doctors dissecting everything apart didn't realize there was an actual living organ there. So what the classics say, the Nanjing says in 31, says it's got a name, but no form. Mm -hmm. That's the interstitial. That's the space between. And so whenever you have a breakdown in communication causing inflammation, and the inflammation is basically saying I need to relate. That's what the heat is generating. It's sort of boiling over because it's isolated. It's been locked down. So what we were talking about at the beginning was you, I'm seeing all these kids when my practice shut down, all of a sudden Zooms opened up and I'm seeing families stressed out because they're not used to being on top of each other yeah. for days and days and days because you mean we have to eat together? Mm-hmm. You mean we have to yeah. work side by side? Yeah. I mean, highlighting the problem. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the spectrum? This, we, we're all yeah. aware of this concept called the spectrum, the ADHD spectrum, or the autism spectrum. I mean, you and I, well, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but what, what are, what are the spectrum? What is the range of the spectrum? So how I love how that. do we define that? Yeah, it's a really good question. So you can have a kid 
who's nonverbal, zero language, banging his head against the wall, looking insane, right? He's completely disconnected from his surroundings on one end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And on the other end, we'll say you have Bill Gates. Now, okay. Bill Gates is a genius, mm -hmm. um, but he's a weird dude. I heard yeah. him speak in like 93. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, on a panel and he was kind of odd. What he was saying was smart, really smart, but it had nothing to do with the conversation going on on the panel. Uh -huh. He was downloading information that he felt he wanted to deliver and he was ready to get up and leave. <laughs> and they said, no, no, you have to wait to hear what other people have to say. And he said, oh, okay. Bewildered, uh -huh. not in any mean way. Yeah. You know, it was Melinda that told him to give his money away. It's not that he was stingy. It, the thought never came into his mind. You know, mm -hmm. he, was just, he was thinking about other things. So I don't, far be it for me to call him anything, any disease. He's the richest man in the world. He made it work for him. Mm -hmm. It's no accident that he invented a window. Right. Through which he could deal with the crazy world out there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And in fact, it's a great model for autism, what he created. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a Mac lover yeah. for this very reason. Because when I had IBM compatible computers in my office, they kept crashing. Mm -hmm. And the reason they crash is because often they don't have enough RAM, mm -hmm. random access memory, which is how many windows can you open at once without it freezing up? Mm -hmm. Whereas Max, the, the operating system has it kind of built in, in a different way. You don't have an overface of a window on top of an operating system. This is very much a great metaphor for what happens in autism. Mm -hmm. Their RAM gets overloaded very quickly. Their RAM happens to be called the hippocampus, mm -hmm. a human being. And the hippocampus is this little organ that mediates information coming in random access memory, working memory, how many things, you know, you know, the little hourglass on the, on the IBMs that working, you yeah. can't give it any information while it's doing that. Mm -hmm. And often we're trying to give information to kids on the spectrum or anybody, you know, someone with MS or someone with, you know, a post-traumatic stress disorder. I consider there are two, there are two things, there are two aspects to this. We have this big spectrum that we're describing and a whole range of things in between the guy on the one end who's zero language disconnected completely banging his head against the wall mm -hmm. and Bill Gates who's operating in a very successful way and we have a whole range of people in between mm -hmm. depending on their ability to adapt right mm -hmm. and I would say to you that the Sanjiao is the modi, modus operandi for adapting mm -hmm. The ministerial fire that you know the you know yuan chi which is so important for adapting to mm -hmm. changing circumstances right it's not the emperor it's 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 the support for the emperor right, right. it's not you know yes it is a heart disorder mm -hmm. autism but it's and about, a san Jiao. that's right it's the so so we have this idea that we have the spectrum but what I'm trying to promote here in this conversation, at least, is that my experience, my personal experience after 35 years, is having seen this epidemic arise, that those kids with the epigenetic form of what looks like on the surface autism mm -hmm. are vastly different beings, and we could call this a different disorder, from Rain Man that I saw back at Columbia Mm -hmm. as that single kid they mm -hmm. shouldn't be called the same thing mm -hmm. for a while they weren't it was called pdd then the, as to distinguish it from autism but nobody knows what to call it because yeah. on the surface the symptoms look the same and you know um let's say if we take wind you know and we say wind is you know what do the classics say you know it's the, the source of a hundred diseases right yeah so that's a distinctly Chinese medicine principle that you can have a hundred different diseases from one cause. Mm -hmm. So if we think about the modern epidemic of autism as distinct from that strictly genetic form that existed for 
you know, 100 years or hundreds of years, we have this new thing, this new epigenetic, environmentally induced post-traumatic stress disorder, mm. psychic, what I call a psychic B syndrome, mm. right? Where you've been hit with something that has utterly blocked you and you're suffering, you're in deep level pain mm -hmm. from this block coming from an accumulation of factors. It's not one bad guy. It's not just the vaccine that causes autism. It's many, many, many different things that come together in sort of a perfect storm. And we're in a perfect storm. Mm -hmm. Just look at what's happening to our environment. Yeah. Look at the fires in California. Mm -hmm. If that's not inflammation, what is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? The indigenous cultures, the Native Americans knew you have to burn away the brush. And they would do these controlled burns every few years. It was built into the culture's tradition. Mm -hmm. If we're not doing that, we get an accumulation that's going to just blow up. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a perfect metaphor. We're a microcosm of that. Yeah. With, as you're talking, I'm thinking about um, an allopathic approach, a, a traditional biomedical approach to these children. Pretty much drug therapy, be some it, behavioral just, therapy. Yeah, there's behavioral isolation. Therapy. Um, yeah, yeah. So the drug therapy is basically, I like that you use the word drug as opposed to pharmaceutical because it's just drugging them. It's literally sedating them. Yes. Because they're in a wild manic state. Yes. Um, the behavioral therapies, weirdly, um, in the early days of the epidemic, when I was literally a, kind of like a pioneer, not knowing what's going on, trying to figure it out for myself, because there was nobody except Sid to talk to. Mm -hmm. um, ABA therapy, applied behavioral analysis, was considered an alternative therapy. Mm -hmm. and I had to go to court just to get that. Oh, wow. And all that is, now you get the diagnosis and you get this therapy. Mm -hmm. But 30 years ago, that was considered alternative. Mm -hmm. you know, no one would pay for it. Um, what it is essentially is, you know, kind of uh, dog training, reward based, do this. And, you know, at the end, you've got a good dog. And yeah. we can do much more than that for autism. Mm -hmm. So not only is there, are there herbs and acupuncture and homeopathy and other alternative ways of approaching. But remember Gawan, mm -hmm. there are games that the family can play mm -hmm. to reach a child who's been alienated mm -hmm. through toxic stress. Mm -hmm. So you have to detox them. You have to get all, you know, clear their head, the phlegm that misses the mind, you have to clear that. But there's also this level of relationship training that I feel has to take place. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a much more elevated level of interaction than just behavioral training. Mm -hmm. Think of it this way, you know, Marshall Rosenberg, the uh, nonviolent communication hero uh, of mine said, you know, below every behavior is a feeling. Mm -hmm. And if you can feel the pain under the behavior, you've already shifted yourself into a compassionate state. Yeah. And underneath that feeling is an unmet need. Mm -hmm. And that's not that different. And if you can find the need and support that need, mm -hmm. you've transformed the whole hierarchy of this. Mm -hmm. Needs based, right? What is the missing need? Now, Leon Hammer, one of my dear friends and teachers said, Steve, and he was an MD who had a path like mine that kind of jumped ship from the conventional MD world mm -hmm. said, um, what is the symptom trying to accomplish and how can we help it do its job? Mm -hmm. That's the opposite of the, the Western pharmaceutical approach of suppressing the symptom. Yeah, cut it off, eradicate it. 
Yeah. Just say no, you shall not pass, right? No more sim no more fever, no more barking, no more right. screaming, no more running around. Yeah. I wanted to share with you. I had last week or the week before, I had a she was a I think she was around a 20-year-old patient. So not a not a child, not a pediatric patient anymore, but just we're all kids. Okay, fair enough. Anyway. She grew up in the Midwest and she had been prescribed something like Concerta, I forget the, the drug, uh, 10 years previous. So she was, she'd been on this drug already since the ripe young age of 10. And I said, you know, and, and you know, different parts of our country are, are more or less drugged, right? Yes. The Midwest happens to be an area that's Absolutely. highly drugged. And so, and no, no judgment or, or yeah, anything, yeah, just yeah. reporting here. Um, she had been on this drug for 10 years and she didn't know why she lost, even lost touch with the physician, the prescribing physician. And so that's part of this inflammatory process too. I mean, it's- Well, it is part of it for sure, but you're raising even a more interesting question. That is definitely part of it, suppressing in Chinese medicine, the principles of suppressing uh, a process is just going to force it to go deeper, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You end up with a Shaoyang syndrome or something where you've got it locked in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but more importantly, or it goes into the woe, and then eventually, you know, you've got some latency thing happening. But more interesting in your point is. Um, you know, you forget why you're on it, you're just taking it off. And that raises a yeah. really fascinating thing to me. Doctors, particularly in the psychiatry world, but even in Western medicine, non-psychiatric, they will start a medicine and they don't want to stop it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Why would you stop it if it's working? So there is no concept. I'll give you a really great example of this principle. So Preemies, who I, I've worked with quite a bit, um, they have this traumatic experience in a hospital. And yeah. many of them are so underdeveloped that they're, they're, you know, they're heart lung relationship is broken. It is so primitive mm -hmm. that they forget to breathe. Mm -hmm. And so they're put on, uh, they have apnea and bradycardia. And so they're put on these monitors and they're sent home, these poor traumatized parents are sent home with a baby on a monitor. Yeah. Once they get home and they're out of the hospital, you can't get a doctor to stop the monitor. Nobody wants to take responsibility. God forbid something happens. So the kid, you know, I've had kids come in and they're like a year old and they're still sleeping on a monitor. And I said, what are you doing? And yeah. nobody has, you know. That's interesting. That nobody wants to take up the charge. And this is what happens with Concerta, you know, that you're, you're patient. Everybody, well, if you've been on it, I don't want to take responsibility for taking them. I don't remember why I'm not a part of it. So this, that's part of the alienation syndrome. Yeah, the communication breakdown. Between the doctor and the patient. Yeah. Between the patient and their own history. Mm -hmm everything's broken down. And part of that is because we live in a society primarily where lineage story doesn't matter. We're living from now to now to now to now to now. Mm -hmm. You just change the channel. And we're not actually seeing the connection between our past and our present anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come back to you, what you were talking about, it, it, this connection uh, with the hippocampus. Yeah. And, and we know acupuncture can affect the hippocampus. We know medic meditation can affect the hippocampus. Yeah. There's a wonderful study out of Harvard that showed just six weeks of meditation yeah. can expand. Yeah, the hippocampus. That's a recent article. Yeah. That just came out. Are you in your practice? Are you, are you working with any sort of QEEG neuroplasticity expanding out or, or, or is it just the play? Not just, I don't, I'm not minimizing just yeah, be the careful. play. See, that's the uh, temptation, right? Yeah. The temptation yeah. is, or are you just playing around? Yeah. No, I do a lot of biofeedback 
Okay, um, that's what I'm getting I'm, at. But I'm more interested. I'm not using, I dabbled in QEEG a long time ago, mm -hmm. but I found it a bit cumbersome and a little too uh, non organic for me. Okay. So the biofeedback I'm drawn to these days is heart rate variability training. Okay. Okay. Um, like heart math, mm -hmm. right? There's one uh, new one out of Ireland that's really interesting called the PIP. P I P. The PIP. Okay. Yeah, check it out. It's I pretty, haven't heard of that. Yeah, and you hold it um, on your fingers, uh -huh. and they're me meditation driven. But the goal is remember I said about the preemies, the heart and the lung aren't speaking. Mm -hmm. it's really the pericardium and the whatever we can dabble about which part of the heart isn't speaking uh, you know it's really the triple burner mm -hmm. it's really the minister fire right the shang ho and the jun ho the the emperor imperial or the gentleman's mm -hmm. sage fire that aren't getting along um and so when you balance heart rate variability through breath work in this biofeedback way. And I, every kid who gets acupuncture is on one of these. Okay. So they can actually see when I put a needle in, they go right into the zone they're supposed to be in. Is there a, is there a screen, like a readout? That yeah, they're on, the, on, on an iPod, uh, iPad. Uh -huh. There's, there are different screens. There's, but you get green points if you're in the zone. Okay. Blue if you're kind of intermediate and red if you're completely heart and lung are on independent trajectories. What's supposed okay. to happen, and you see this in Qigong all the time, what's supposed to happen. Greg, I'm sure you're a very experienced acupuncturist. So have you ever had someone pass out when you put needles in? Sure. Yeah, it's who, a known who thing. Who hasn't? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, it's a known thing. And it means you got such a powerful da chi that they kind of left their body for a minute. Um, and you have to bring them back in. But mm -hmm. the idea is what's really happening from a physiologic perspective is that the, it's a vasovagal uh, syncope, right? Mm -hmm. And so the vagus is, su you've actually suddenly accessed the vagus mm -hmm. um, through your needle and they're not used to living there. Mm -hmm. They're used to living in fight or flight. It's often people living in fight or flight that will have these vasovagal responses. And an easy way to check if they're going to go there when you're needling is check their pupils first. Mm -hmm. If their pupils are huge, before you needle with them, do some Qigong breathing with them. Yeah. So get those pupils down. Mm -hmm. And then feel their pulse. And in feeling them, I do this with kids all the time. You have them breathe in. And what's supposed to happen in healthy heart rate variability, vagal tone, mm -hmm. is that when you breathe in, your heart rate speeds up. When you breathe out, it slows down. Mm -hmm. And they don't teach this in pulse diagnosis, but it's a very important aspect of pulse diagnosis to know that ministerial fire or the lower jiao or whatever you want to call it, Ming men is communicating with the heart emperor, that there is this good relationship between the minister and the king, right? Or the emperor. And so once you see the pupils drop down, and get bigger if it's dark and smaller. Now they've got their rhythm back. Then you needle them, you won't have a syncopal episode, right? So the same is true in this training. So when I do the heart rate variability, heart math is the one I use the most because it's got pretty screens. One gets bigger and smaller and you get these green points and things, very kid friendly. But really what's cool is they see the effect of acupuncture right before their eye. Yeah, and it's playful. At colors and shapes and the gala. Oh, there's one. There's one screen that actually shows you where you're diving. You're in. You're in the green, and you're starting uh -huh. to drift. And I say, uh -huh. now let's do. Come on, calm yourself down, buddy. Let's bring yourself back. You're starting to crash, uh -huh. right? Let me let me stimulate that needle and bring you back in, and it becomes a real um, collaborative. Mm -hmm. It's not me doing something to them, which is a very Western. Uh, well, I can't say Western because I know some Chinese medicine practitioners who have this hierarchical, you know, you're, you're just a piece of meat, I'll work on you, as right. opposed to a more partnership way of empowering the patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to mention one other uh, patient I had. This was years ago, and I'm not proud to say that I felt like I couldn't help him. A mother came 
with the her son i forget how old not much more than than 10 or 11 kid walked in with no no shoes uh barely dressed the mother was holding him and he was constantly fidgeting in his in her arms looking around and you know got him in the treatment room and i was i was bewildered i didn't know i was completely out of out of my league i you know really the first autistic kid i had seen yeah. in way way you know way on this way gone for me and she shared with me that he only ate like saltine crackers yeah just, yeah, yeah just the worst wow. diet on the world what would you do in this case so yeah so that's beautiful and i really appreciate your humility and honesty in that one of the best um uh teachings i did with ephraim once we were doing a year-long course in pediatrics teaching at actc and, and uh i we decided we were going to teach all the failures one day all the failed cases where we couldn't help Mm -hmm. mainly to demystify the fact that none of us have all the answers right and it was and at the end the students thought that was the best of all the weekends that we had done mm. because it gave them permission to experiment and not have the pressure of, well steve could treat this so why is there something wrong with me but yeah. to answer your question i've dealt with that all the time there are several points in fact i left one of my offices I, my office in Westchester is like a house mm -hmm. with open doors and different rooms and things. And sometimes I will have to walk around needling someone, a kid like that, uh -huh. one needle at a time in and out as they're moving through space of the room. Oh, wow. they're okay. in fight, fight. But here's what I would have done. Yeah. This is, what you're presenting is actually a very common Quang part of the Dian Quang couple right. um this hyper agitated disconnected state mm -hmm. the first thing i do to show the parents there's somebody in there mm. it's kind of like magic and i'm giving it away here but i will uh -huh. be teaching more about this at the symposium mm -hmm. is you take a tuning fork low frequency tuning fork and you put it on do 20 the big ones the big ones and yeah you just put it on do 20 while yeah. she's in the arm okay it stops everything interesting stops cold and suddenly just he may not look at you mm -hmm. he just stops and listens because you're doing bone conduction there mm -hmm. right at the po you know somewhere around the posterior fontanelle yeah. which is the connection to the heavens mm -hmm. and for the first time he feels connected to something outside himself fantastic healing the space between Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The next thing, often what I'll do at the same time is I'll put my middle finger, pericardium, mm -hmm. on lung nine, the deep abyss, mm -hmm. right? Tai Yuan, it's called, mm -hmm. right? And you just rest your hand there while you've got the other one there. Mm -hmm. And you've created an amazing circuit, mm -hmm. right? Between Du channel and the Ren, right? And with this source point of, you know, the lung, it's a very, very powerful place. Or you could do it on, you know, uh, LI-11, uh, LI, uh, lung seven, which lung is seven. a ghost point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could pick any of the ghost points in that moment where you have someone who's essentially not here. Yeah. He's somewhere else yeah. in the, but there's someone there. And when you show the mother that there's actually someone inside, mm -hmm. that's the healing for the day. Mm -hmm. No more, mm -hmm. less is more, right? Yeah. And then say, all right, I'd like to see him back and we'll do this a few times till he feels safe in my presence. Yeah. And feels like there is someone that can connect with him. Yeah. So you know what often happens? Then I'll say, put him down. Mm -hmm. And he'll go running around and then he'll come back and give you do 20 because <laughs> he enjoyed it not just enjoyed it needs the connection needs, needs the connection yeah. yeah that's beautiful yeah and it's a very effective thing to show you're willing 
to find a way through the chaos of the mists, that inflammation of the mind. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the Shen is, is, is collapsed, you know, yeah. it's contracted, we'll say. Mm -hmm. I think Machioso says it's contracted, you know, mm -hmm. that um, in these states, what's supposed to happen is it's expansive. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I often call these kids on the spectrum, the inside out child. Mm. They're so raw to things. And I'll tell many stories about different cases in the symposium, because yeah. we have enough time that I can show different forms of this and different mm. approaches to the different forms. There's no one autism. Yeah. There are different human beings coming in. Well, I think um, with that pearl of beautiful wisdom, I think we are going to uh, wrap up here. Um, I do want to ask you, so you've, you've shared a lot about what you're going to be covering in the symposium, and I can't wait to be in that, in that symposium and, and just learn much more about, about just treating children in general and again i shared i've got four so i've been yeah. doing my own kids so you've but, been treating them yeah and i love i love i love that you brought back the the connection of treating the family and the, and the connection between the family alex tiberi whom i'm sure you know rest in peace one of my one of my yeah. favorite teachers used to always say that if you treat if you, parents bring the kids in if your kid's sick and you're treating the kid you got to treat the, the the parent I have so many stories like that over the years, you know, that forced me to contend with that reality that um, in Western training and even in Chinese medicine training, I find a problem that we isolate the patient from the rest of his love, <laughs> you know, yeah. from the matrix of support, the nest of beings that are supporting him. And so, you know, all right, come on into the room. You can stay out there. That's over. Yes. That kind of thought has to change because that's yes. how we got into the mess to begin with. Yes. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for sharing your your wisdom and, and just your beautiful presence with us. Um, I know our listeners are going to really enjoy this. And, well, it's and, been a pleasure. Uh, and you're a heartfelt uh, person to speak with. And it means a lot to me to have not just the quality of your voice in the room with me, but just your essence is really made, makes it easy, your curiosity and interest and intellect and experience. So, uh, and, and humility is, makes it this whole thing worthwhile. So I hope I can see, I wish we were all gonna be there in person this year. Yeah. It saddens me that we're not. Because yeah. um, it's the conversations on the breaks that mean the most to me in those conferences. Yes. That's the missing link in autism. Uh, I'll share one more thing. I was at a Shabbat dinner uh, on Friday, uh, and I met a woman who had lived through the polio uh, epidemic in, in Germany. She was living in Germany at the time. And she remembers when they wouldn't be able to go in the pool, you know, because of you'd catch polio, I guess. Through, and I didn't know that you'd it's catch water. it. Through, yeah. Well, okay. So I didn't know that. But anyway, you, they That's kept why people the out of oral the polio was so much better a vaccine uh -huh. than the than the because the oral polio was a live vaccine mm -hmm. that went through your gut, which is the way you get polio. Yeah. As opposed to tricking the body and putting it in a muscle, which is yeah. not where you actually, your, your system isn't geared to that. Yeah. But what, what I was reflecting on is that, you know, we got through that. We got through the Spanish flu. We smallpox. Smallpox. We survived World War I and II. We're going to get through this. We're going yeah. to be back together. And it's just in short order and we've learned new things like this you know we've well made... i would say you know the timing of this um is great because um in october we'll be in a different place than even where we are right now and yes. what we've all come through together the whole world mm -hmm. and it's the first time the whole world has had a pandemic you know mm -hmm. it's the awareness of being shut down and shut out 
all at the same time. I think what I'm planning to teach is about how to come back together in a healthier way. Yes. What have we, what has COVID taught us mm -hmm. as opposed to, I never want to think about that again, right? Yes. What have we learned? The silver linings, you know, mm -hmm. um, that was the name of one of the songs I wrote during the darkest part of this COVID thing is there are silver linings in this experience that we For can put sure. forward. Our For relationship sure. to nature, how much nature are we getting in our day, right? Mm. All of these things, how do we stay together, not on screens in different rooms? How do we, all of these things COVID has taught us for a reason. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, I love the way you're saying it because we will get through this is the point. And it's yeah. a good way to end on a positive note. And yeah. some of the teaching, I think most of what Symposium is going to talk about, I feel in my heart is, wow, what did we all just go through? And how does that pertain to this topic or this topic or this topic? That means we're adapting. For sure. Well, my friend and now colleague, I really look forward to seeing you again. Yes. Thank you so much for the uh, time together. It's been great. my pleasure. Yeah. Take care. All right, be well. You too.